Good morning, this is Margaret Malloy, Chief Marketing Officer of Siegel and & Gale and Chair of the New York Hub of the Marketing Society. The Marketing Society is a global organization of marketeers. We have hubs around the world and I have the pleasure of chairing our New York board. It's an influential organization of over 3,000 people. Everything we do, we do through a brave lens. We host conversations, we host events, and in recent times, we have pivoted the entire program to virtual. This morning, or indeed for those of you in the UK and elsewhere, good afternoon. We are thrilled to welcome the founding community editor for LinkedIn, Victoria Taylor. And in a few moments, Victoria will walk us through a workshopping session where we will learn to optimize our LinkedIn presence. Now, the discussion that I find myself often in is around personal branding. And it's a rich topic, it's a topic that I have a lot of passion for. But one of the things that I always conclude my discussions on is the importance of the platforms, how we present ourselves digitally. And never has this been more important than it is today. When asked about the importance of personal branding, I will say to you that it's essential. Everyone has a personal brand, whether you choose to or decide to leave it untended. And the opportunity for us today is to explore how we can use LinkedIn to project that presence that we want. There are, of course, two components to it. There is our LinkedIn profiles and how we show up, and then there is our day-to-day -day use of the platform. Victoria, in this workshop, will take us through both dimensions, setting up the fabulous profile that we all deserve and want, and then behaving in a way that is consistent with the brand that we aim to perpetuate. Throughout the course of the session, we welcome questions. I invite you to please use the Q&A section on the bottom of your screen. In that tab, please insert the questions. Victoria has uh, selected a number of profiles from our guests, and she's going to live workshop those profiles. At the end of Victoria's session, I will moderate some questions to the extent there are questions remaining that have not been covered by Victoria through the course of the session this morning. So I believe that's it from a logistics standpoint. Once again, I'd introduce Victoria Taylor, founding community editor of LinkedIn and native of Wisconsin, I believe, Milwaukee no less. Victoria is joining us this morning, like myself, from New York City. I will hand over to you, Victoria. A very good morning and thank you so very much for serving the community here. Thank you so much, Margaret. Can you hear my sound? We can. And I will say that when I approached Victoria to uh, contribute to the Marketing Society, she was very gracious. And this session has been among the most popular. And we believe it's because it's a time when people are taking stock. Either the marketing community is finding ourselves in need of seeking new employment opportunities or speaking engagement opportunities, or indeed finding ourselves as spokespeople for our companies, which in turn requires that we have a compelling digital presence. So this is the session to reboot your LinkedIn. And without further ado, my friend, Victoria Taylor. Thank you so much. Um, and again, uh, we I'm so grateful for all of you being here and, and joining us today. And I'm going to jump right into the presentation. So starting off with discussing optimizing your LinkedIn presence. So what we're going to be covering in this workshop is individualized recommendations. So I went through um, a bunch of the different profiles of individuals who RSVP'd to attend this webinar. And I actually went through and made custom recommendations for their profile, uh, whether they're looking to increase visibility as it might relate to potential job opportunities, building their personal brand, landing speaking engagements, or attracting clients. So my hope is that by walking through these sample profiles... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Victoria. Thank you for troubleshooting and thank you everyone. Sorry about that. All right, sorry about that. Um, okay, so back to Adam's profile. 
So I would suggest um, for optimizing his LinkedIn headline. So the headline is this uh, top part of the profile directly underneath your name. Optimizing it by connecting those keywords with a narrative and removing the emojis. So emojis, while they may add visual flair, they actually uh, sort of, uh, they're not considered uh, text. So if you're trying to get attention from any sort of an automated program or search uh, or anything like that, the emoji um, may be not exactly helpful in that regard. So I, I would maybe connect this into a narrative and remove those emojis. And lastly, he may want to switch from a connect to a follow. Um, so that allows you to increase your LinkedIn following. So the difference between connections and followers is that connections are people that you have directly worked with, collaborated with, know, um, and have built a relationship with. Followers can be anyone who wants to follow you to get inspired by your content. So when I scroll a little bit further down on Adam's profile, he's a solid about page, but it doesn't really tell us a little bit um, more. It would be great to get an idea of what he's all about, where he's based, what he's passionate about, and some unique uh, specific calls to action um, around uh, campaigns he's worked on, brands he's excited about, things he's, he's proud of. He is using his new featured section. So the featured section is a new addition to LinkedIn profiles, but um, this is an article he wrote on LinkedIn, which is fantastic. Is there more that he could be putting in there? Um, you know, perhaps um, projects that he's done that um, were very visual. The featured section is really all about pulling in people at a glance and letting them see what you're proud of. And Adam's content is sharing, and sharing is great. He is commenting on different content. He is sharing original essays on LinkedIn. So he's doing a great job of, of in, interacting and engaging with the community. So my specific recommendations for Adam's profile were to be, would be to add more examples of what you do in your story. Um, for instance, I don't know what April Shower's podcast creative brief means. Um, and chances are many people visiting your profile may not be familiar with that. So if you are a guest on a podcast, give us more context let us know how we can subscribe share and listen um, i would encourage him to leverage his uh profile to showcase his nonprofit expertise and then build out his network by turning on follow instead of connect profile number two is danit aronson um, i love the cover image it's really beautiful just grabs your attention her headline is very clear chief partnership officer at csm and uh it may make, make sense for her to turn on her follow to help grow her existing 3,500 plus followers. Her about section is extremely strong. I don't think that there's much she can really improve on there. Um, and I love that she's including these concrete examples of notable brands that she's worked with, awards and um, accolades and honors she, she's received. Um, all of this tells me a really complete story about her and it gives me a lot of opportunities to start a conversation with her. However, Denny is not currently leveraging her featured section. And the featured section is a very visual section where she could showcase some of these incredible ideas and projects that she's done. She does post about content every week approximately, but she is primarily resharing the CSM brand page content. So I think that there's a real opportunity here to showcase her perspective and her thought leadership. Is there a way for her to maybe create a virtual speaker series, a newsletter, or a podcast? Um, what is she seeing in her unique role as Chief Partnership Officer at CSM that others may not be able to necessarily see? Um, how can she be a part of that conversation? So my recommendation for Danit would be to use the featured section to draw attention to her work and past public speaking engagements, leverage her profile to share thought leadership, whether short or long form, that allows you to connect with your audience, continue to build her network by utilizing follow, and, um, and if she is looking to lead more workshops, um, roundtables, speaking opportunities, using that content to leverage that visibility into her capabilities. Profile number three um, is Elaine. So Elaine is missing a custom cover image and that's a real opportunity to tell her story. Right now it's the default blue. Would love to see more about her um, by customizing that cover image. Her headline is clear. Um, and in her case, does she want to make uh, her profile follow or does she want to continue to just maintain connections with people that she knows and has collaborated with? So does she want to build that audience of followers or does she want to continue to focus on connections? The about page is solid, but it doesn't include much about her personally. Where is she originally from? Where is she based now? What makes her passionate about what she does? Any proud milestones that she can share? 
And um, the featured section is unfortunately missing from this profile, and that could be used to help underscore those ideas. So again, featured is a great new way to help tell your story in a visual way. She posts about every month or so on LinkedIn, and she is sharing great relevant content. Is there an opportunity to maybe discover more conversations on LinkedIn? So on LinkedIn, you may not be aware, but you can actually follow hashtags. You can follow influencers. So you see she's following Alex Borsky and Richard Branson up here on the upper right hand side. Um, you can follow additional companies as well as join groups and, um, and engage in conversation there. So if um, she is, is sharing work that she's proud of, are there ways to start those additional dialogues? So my recommendations for Elaine would be to customize her profile with an about a cover image and the new featured section, layer in that additional context and about, and then build additional posting regularity and look for ways to get plugged into that larger LinkedIn ecosystem. So that rather than posting once a, once a month, maybe it's once a week, um, trying to work towards that, that consistency to help her grow and nurture the, that network. Profile number four is Helena. Love the cover cover image, love the profile photo, it's very attention grabbing. Direct and accurate headline. Um, and I would suggest that Helena consider turning on follow to help build her following on the LinkedIn platform. Her about section is extremely well written. Um, she's, but when I scroll down a bit further and looked at her experience, she's worked with some really exciting companies and brands. Um, if it's appropriate and Helena was comfortable with doing that, she may very well want to bring in those exciting companies and brands into her about section. And, um, and I thought that was a really interesting way to use featured um, so that she is basically making herself available to answer people's business questions. You can actually feature two items or more in featured as a visible preview. Like you can feature a lot more than two items, but you can feature two visible items, at least on desktop. On mobile, I believe it's 1.5. So um, if Advisory Cloud is your number one priority that you want to promote, you can totally do that. But if you also want to share um, volunteer work that you're doing or specific campaigns that you're proud of, you can do that as well. So featured, you have those, you can rank and tier the order of the items that you want people to see. Um, I love that she's sharing glimpses of work from home life. Um, I think that it'd be really interesting to share additional perspectives on what it's like to work at such a renowned audio brand like Audible. Um, and there's another opportunity here as well, because Audible is such an, a huge player in terms of the audio space. Uh, what books is she reading? Are there videos or podcasts that you're listening or working on or creating that you might want to showcase to build up your thought leadership? So, so clearly Helena is participating in a lot of exciting events and, um, and other types of, of showcases. And I would say that, again, you know, there's a lot of incredible content that she's creating. And Audible is, you know, doing a lot of different content creation efforts and exciting activations. So thinking about ways to share those as well. So I would say that uh, your about is super interesting, Helena. What more can you share with us? It might be worth including additional assets for your featured. And then showcasing your talents, interests, and thought leadership. You've had so many interesting experiences. How can others be inspired or engaged with you? Profile number five is Linda. So I love the cover image and the headshot. The reason why I think this cover image is such a strong choice is because it tells me instantly she's based in New York. Um, you know, she's, she's out there in a fast paced, fast moving communications culture. So that's what this image tells me at a glance. It gives me a lot of context with which I can sort of frame the, the larger story that Linda's profile is telling me. Um, I do think that it might be helpful to her to remove the VP Global Communications from her name section, just because your name is your name, and uh, when people search for it, you really want to optimize the discovery of your name, and by adding VP Global Communications, that might sort of make it a little bit more challenging for people to find you. I do think uh, Linda may want to consider changing to follow versus connect, um, because she has so many interesting things to say and projects she's working on. And, um, and her headline seems to be cut off. So there are so many great things in this headline that we're sort of running a little bit over. So is there a way that we can summarize all of those skills and maybe make it fit in a more concise use of space? Um, Linda's a very robust about section. Um, I would consider sitting down and trying to condense this into two paragraphs. There are very impressive awards and credentials and you don't have to fit them all in your about section. You actually, there's a dedicated area of your LinkedIn profile if you scroll down the page 
that where you can actually list out individual awards that you've received or honorifics or accomplishments or even skills. You can take skills learning courses on LinkedIn Learning. And uh, once you complete those assessments, those will be along on your profile as well as other endorsements you receive. Uh, Linda is also unfortunately missing the new featured section. And that's a real shame because she's writing some really interesting articles. Uh, with featured, you can actually showcase those articles like we showed earlier with Adam. And with publications that Linda's been writing, like three things your company can do now to improve diversity and inclusion, showcasing that thought leadership top page is so incredibly helpful. So Linda's sharing fantastic articles and content. Um, I think that if anything, we might wanna suggest posting in a more consistent way. You know, would you wanna start a LinkedIn newsletter? LinkedIn newsletters are in beta right now, and they basically allow you to serialize a series of essays to subscribers and build an additional audience on your profile. So if this is something where you'd wanna to commit to writing an essay every week or an essay every month, um, I think that that could be a really interesting way to engage more consistently. So my recommendation specifically for Linda would be to condense her about section, um, make it a little bit easier to read, um, easier for people to sort of go through at a glance, and then leverage feature to showcase her past publications. Add those awards and honorifics to the specific LinkedIn section towards the lower half of your profile devoted to them. And then considering to create additional content to build your following and maybe to switch from a connect to a follow to help do that as well. Profile number six is Mark um, or Marcus. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. <clears throat> so Mark, Mark is missing a cover image, which is unfortunate. Again, he has such a great piece of real estate here that he could be using to help tell his story. He's also missing his company name and current role from his headline. And I think that that's really um, a missed opportunity as well because uh, that's a great network that you can tap into of, oh, so-and-so works at this company. Great, I had no idea. I should totally introduce them to these other contacts. And then lastly, for this section, I would wanna ask Mark if he wants to turn on follow versus message as primary call to action. So you see right up here that message is his primary. Um, that's great, you know, I, I think that making yourself accessible to other people who may wanna contact you through LinkedIn is, is fantastic, but is this something where Mark wants to build his audience or does he wanna just message other users? I'm not sure. So I think that that is worth calling out. Um, I think that honestly his about and his featured are perfect. Um, this is a fantastic narrative that he's put together. It tells me who he is, where he's coming from, where he's going, um, his educational accomplishments, um, what he's super passionate about. And again, these, this featured section, look how visual this is. This is really, really great use of that section. This is exactly what we would love to see for everybody. So yay. Um, as far as activity, he's sharing great content, but unfortunately it's very, very inconsistent. There was a big gap in posting. Three months was, was the previous post before this one on screen. So if there's any areas of opportunity and growth for Mark, I would say that sharing additional essays, announcements, the exciting partnerships and initiatives he's working on, or just keeping others up to date on industry trends. All of those are great areas where his voice can be a part of the conversation. So my recommendations for Mark would be to add a cover image to accompany his fantastic about and featured section, asking whether he wants people to follow him as a primary call to action versus message. And then lastly, you're working on really exciting projects in a dynamic space that a lot of people wanna know more about. Is there an opportunity to build your brand as a thought leader by sharing more consistently on LinkedIn? Profile number seven is Nick. So I love the way that Nick uses his cover image and, um, and his profile photo to kind of really maximize the use of that real estate. It lets me know exactly who he is at a glance. Um, my question would be, does he want to make follow his primary call to action um, versus message? Again, we talked about message earlier. It's a personal choice. Some people may want to keep that their settings that way. But if you're looking to build your audience, follow making follow primary is the best way to do that. And then lastly, um, does he want to clarify his headline so he's not repeating booster consulting twice? So maybe just make it director and founder, comma, booster consulting limited. Um, Nick's profile is a very brief about section. Um, I would ask, is there a reason to tell us why you started Booster Consulting, what your unique areas of expertise are? Um, I think like, obviously we can click through and visit the Consult Booster site, but I think that using that about section to tell your story in a little bit more of a robust way would be fantastic. 
Nick's also missing that featured section, which could be used to showcase booster consulting case studies or branding. So um, featured could be a really great asset as, um, as he looks to raise that visibility of a new company. Um, Nick unfortunately hasn't had the chance to post in a month. So I would ask, how can you build that unique brand voice for Booster, especially as you're getting started? Um, and I would also think about what are some verticals you're looking to target and how can you merge in those conversations? So would an essay series or a newsletter make sense or is podcasting or videos more your cup of tea? Again, these tools are um, out there on LinkedIn and I think that consistency and basically asking how am I adding value to my followers' timelines? So if they're able to turn to you and get exclusive marketing recommendations or ideas or inspiration that they can't get anywhere else, that's a fantastic reason for them to follow you and share what you're doing. And, and then while they're doing that, they're helping to support Booster Consulting as well. So my recommendations for Nick would be to turn connect to follow and build up his about section. Uh, leverage featured to help tell that Booster Consulting story in a more visual way. And then leverage content creation on LinkedIn to help build this following and create a larger network and conversation. So profile number eight is Pam. Um, I love this unique cover image. Um, I am just not sure if it ties into your story. So Pam works in live and location-based entertainment. She has a fantastic entertainment background. Um, I think that there may be, I would choose a cover image that might be an awards show or um, maybe a reel of film or something that really tells that unique entertainment perspective at a glance that you're able to be like, wow, that's incredible. Um, the headline's a little bit unclear. I do think that there's an opportunity, opportunity to tell more of her story there. Um, and it doesn't look like featured is currently being used and asking, you know, do you want to make follow your primary call to action? So again, I put the featured part on the wrong slide, but it's missing here, which is a bit of a bummer. Great opportunity to showcase projects you've worked on that have won awards, um, really exciting articles that maybe you've been a part of, all of that can be showcased and featured. It's a great solid about section, um, but it is kind of missing some uh, of some of those elements of the amazing brands that she's worked with. Um, so when you scroll a bit further down Pam's profile, you're gonna see that, you know, she's working at Walt Disney, Technicolor, 20th Century Fox, and Hit Entertainment. Like, those are incredible brands. So can you tell us more? Um, did you help to launch Frozen? Did you bring in Star Wars? Like, these, these are all fantastic stories and they give people touch points to be able to engage with you. So again, I would suggest adding featured and um, maybe adding a little bit more technicolor, horrible pun intended, uh, to, to those, those experiences you've had. Um, it doesn't look like Pam has had the chance to share any content in the past six months. Um, so I think that having the incredible background and expertise in the entertainment and brand space that she does, um, I think that there's a real opportunity to kind of share, like, how, how are people adjusting around coronavirus? You know, how are we seeing um, titles like Frozen 2, again, coming to Disney Plus? How are we seeing, um, you know, programming adjust and change? Where are unique ideas where you can layer in your thought and expertise and insight? Um, I think that all of those are fantastic ways to merge into that larger conversation and build your own voice as a thought leader. So my recommendations for Pam would be to adjust connect to follow and clarify her headline a little bit. Um, leverage her featured section to help tell her story and then grow her voice as part of the entertainment and marketing landscape. If people are looking up hashtag movies or hashtag um, mo uh, entertainment marketing, do you want people to find your profile? And, and if they do, what do you want them to take away from your perspectives? Um, and I think that that ties in that larger content creation idea is are you consistently creating that content and starting those conversations. Profile number nine, and don't worry, we're getting towards the end here so we can answer those questions. Um, profile number nine is Rachel. Um, Rachel is missing her cover image and she may want to switch message to follow as primary call to action. Uh, her profile, her about section is, is very, very, very brief. Um, what do you specifically focus on at Game Theory? What are some unique skill sets you bring, clients you've worked on that you're proud of? Um, Again, you know, I, I looked up what game theory was, but uh, it's always very helpful to spell that out for people so they understand, like, oh, fantastic, they'd be perfect for ABC that we're working on. Um, I know that these are all, you know, fantastic uh, email marketing and programming skills, but it's always great to fill in those gaps in that story. Um, and then Rachel's also missing the featured section, which is a chance to show off press or work that she may want to display. Um, she is sharing interesting content from brand pages, which is great. Um, but I would maybe think about 
would you want to add more additional thoughts and insights? Um, you know, is there more that you would want to say about um, this marketing effectiveness in the new normal Q&A? So my recommendations for Rachel would be to upload a cover image to her profile and maybe turn it from message to follow. Build out the about to expand additional storytelling and context, as well as leveraging the featured section. And then third, um, beyond sharing content from brand pages that have already published it, what are those original pieces of thought leadership and conversation starters that, that you can bring to the table? Profile number 10 is Reshma. Um, she's missing her cover image, which is a, a bummer. So I would love to see a beautiful uh, cover image to accompany this incredible profile. She might want to add her company name to her headline. So again, we have a lot of incredible accomplishments in this headline. Um, I, I think like if you want to throw in the company name in there, uh, her current role, I think that that'd be super helpful. Um, and I love that she has follow as her primary call to action. Yay. Uh, so her about is absolutely fantastic. It really tells me why she's passionate about what, doing what she's doing, what her background is, what her skill sets are, um, where she's based, what she's done. Um, again, you know, that's really what about is. Uh, think about when you flip to the back cover of a book and you're reading the author blurb, that's exactly what your about page is. Um, so I think that that's a really, really great way to think about your about section is that it's not just keywords where you hope that if someone's searching for brand transformation that they find your profile, but it's really about telling your story and maybe including the hashtag or the keyword brand transformation. Um, she's also using her featured section very effectively, as you can see. Um, you know, it's really underscoring who she is and what her story is all about. She's also sharing really great content about what it's like to work from home, coronavirus challenges, shout outs to other worthy organizations. So I think all, all of this is great. Um, I would ask that if she wants to continue to build out speaking opportunities and speaking visibility, it might be helpful to think about creating content herself that ties into those goals. So uh, you know, would she want to put together her own podcast, maybe host a roundtable or a virtual conversation of some kind, all of that to give people an idea of what it's like to have her moderate or lead a conversation. So recommendations for Reshma would be to add a cover image to her profile. And as she continues to share content and build her following, thinking about how you can use it to underscore your passion for connecting with others in public speaking. Um, obviously, coronavirus has changed so much of our event planning world. Um, so we have gone fully virtual. And I think that that opens up a lot of possibilities for putting together virtual roundtables, virtual summits, virtual conversations, where people can participate anytime, anywhere. Um, and profile 11, Steven. So I love this headshot. It's fantastic. The cover image is better than no cover image at all, but it's kind of blurry. Um, is there something that better expresses who Steven is and where he's based? Headline is great. It's direct. It tells me exactly who he is and what he does. And then lastly, he may want to change message to follow um, if he wants to build out his following. A very robust about section. Uh, which is great, um, but I think you might want to add a, a little bit about his background, a little bit about his education or past companies, because um, again, you see a lot of these great areas of expertise, but um, I think that, you know, letting us know why it is you do what you do and what keeps you motivated is always helpful. Great use of featured. Please see these amazing past speaking opportunities he's done, interviews he's been featured in, Bloomberg articles, all of this is great, so awesome use of featured. Steven's also sharing interesting content from other brands, influencers, and articles. So um, I, I'm seeing a lot of resharing, um, and I might ask him what are ways that he'd want to create content where he'd want to merge in the conversation. So sharing is great. It tells us something about who you are and um, what, what you engage with. But I also think about how can your voice be a part of the conversation too. So recommendations for Steven would be to update his cover image and make his primary call to action follow. Layering in additional references to his about section, and then if he's comfortable with it, because again, not everybody may want to merge in the conversation, but if he is, how he can merge into that personal branding conversation and letting people know, um, hey, here's an article I read. I was inspired by that to, to write my own piece about what it's like to contemplate the future of branding. Um, and then that way other people can join that conversation too. So we've tackled a lot. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, let's see.
And uh, let's, let's jump right into the Q&A uh, with Margaret moderating. Yes, hello again, Victoria. Thank you very much for that whirlwind tour of 11 profiles. I hope all of us found that instructive as well as the 11 participants. So Victoria, I've been monitoring the Q&A and there are a number of themes emerging. The first one is, could you walk us through again the distinction between connect and follow and how, where in the system can someone affect that change? Absolutely. So connect, uh, let me show you how to make, uh, so I'm going to do a share screen really quickly. Let me do that real quick. Right now. All right. So going to my very messy desktop. Don't judge my tabs. So this, I'm going to send around this link in chat momentarily, but this shows you how you can manage, you can follow your updates. So if you want to uh, update your settings in privacy, it's a very easy switch to make to make follow primary. And so by making follow primary, that will encourage people to follow you. They can still connect with you, but by making that following primary, that allows you to continue to grow your presence without accepting every single friend request or connection request that you get on LinkedIn. So the difference between connections and followers is that um, connections are people that you actually have a relationship with. So when someone is uh, connected with you, it basically allows them to almost use you as a sort of a reference. That's why you can see the mutual connections that you have, and that helps to build trust. So if I see that Margaret knows um, John Smith, I'm going to be like, oh, fantastic. Clearly, he must be awesome because he knows Margaret. So connections sort of follow, um, create almost a referral system in a way that allows you to really harness that powerful relationships. Um, follows are for people that maybe want to follow your content. So they follow Margaret's updates, they follow Margaret's blogs and speaking, but they don't know Margaret personally. So I think that that's a distinguishing um, difference is that connections is really meant for people that you know and that you trust and you have a relationship with and um, it can actually speak to, oh, um, I'm going to type the answer out to this uh, quickly. Uh, so it really allows you to, to grow your audience. And so that's how you can see people like Ariana Huffington, who has 9 million followers. You actually cap out at about 30,000 connections on LinkedIn. So you see a lot of people who are like, oh, I want to add you as a connection, and that's great. But once the connection is a reciprocal relationship, and so they're seeing your updates, you're seeing theirs, and that can get really noisy if you're at 30,000 connections. And that sort of makes it difficult for you to get the valuable insights from your network um, versus like if you follow, let's say, Bill Gates and Richard Branson and, um, you know, the CMO of, of whatever, and then you're getting those updates from them. You don't know Bill Gates, but you're still getting his updates as the algorithm kind of feeds them to you. Victoria, can you speak about recommendations? What's the optimum number? How does one solicit recommendations? What's your view on them in general? Yeah, I think recommendations are very powerful. Um, I think that it's a fantastic way to sort of show um, reciprocity. So to build that sort of mutual trust and, and respect. Um, I think that there is no ideal number. I see people who have hundreds of them. I see people with dozens. I see people with a handful. Um, I think that it's really just about, you know, is this authentic? Is this genuine? Is this something that you really are passionate about? And, um, you know, it's, it's really your way of saying like, hey, I'm essentially saying that this other person is incredible at what they do. So I would say to let your, um, let your uh, relationship and your past experience with them kind of be the guide and uh, be as generous as you can. Victoria, there's some questions about the headline, whether someone should use their exact job title or other terms to optimize. How does the algorithm work? Do, because titles can be very company dependent. That's correct. Yeah, I, um, I think that it's obviously depending on um, which organization you're at, because again, as you mentioned, they are sort of fluid and changing across companies. But I also think like, when you're trying to fit too much in there, as we saw with a couple of examples, it's really difficult to get a handle on, on, on where that dialogue can begin. So I think about it as being the best thought starter for um, a conversation. And if someone sees your profile and they don't know you, what is the impression of you that, they, you, that you want them to take away? Um, so I think that if you are, you know, an experienced brand catalyzer, 
fantastic. Like that tells me that you're really good at making change and making effective growth and, and strategy. So I think about it as telling the story. If you have a story to tell that is um, context dependent on a company or a role, include that. And then if you, um, if you don't want to have it be context dependent on a company or a role, then um, thinking about how you can encapsulate that as effectively as possible. So Victoria, there's some curiosity around how the algorithm works, um, mm -hmm. specifically around posts versus follows. And should someone republish an entire article that appeared elsewhere to their LinkedIn or simply post it with a link? What's the optimum? Um, so LinkedIn does not uh, punish you for resharing content that you've published elsewhere. So if you did an op-ed for Thrive Global or for Medium or for your personal blog, you can totally reshare that and republish that on LinkedIn and make an essay on LinkedIn to share your thought leadership there. Um, if you wrote a chapter for a book and you want to share the chapter for the book on LinkedIn, you can do that too. Um, I just think that it's always helpful to add some, bring it, uh, relevant commentary around it. So when you share an essay to your LinkedIn profile, um, you're actually going to be prompted to include a couple of sentences along with that. And I think that the, those sentences are very, very important. So if you're resharing an article, you might want to say, I wrote this article for the Harvard Business Review back in 2008. And I find that with coronavirus, it's more timely now than ever. Let me know if you agree. And, and really just, um, you can reuse and reshare and repurpose that previously created content, which I think is great. Because again, you know, if you put all that work into writing it, you don't want to lose that. Uh, but it allows you to engage and in, in to potentially harness a new audience. Um, I think it's always helpful to include hashtags with that. I think that you don't want to go into hashtag overload. I'm going to share the hashtag uh, best practices for LinkedIn, um, if I can find it. Uh, here we go. So I'm going to share this around in chat right now. We have a best practices guide towards using hashtags on LinkedIn. Um, and I would recommend using not more than a handful and really being strategic. So hashtag marketing, hashtag email marketing, really being looking for the intersection of the most relevant hashtags and the most impactful hashtags you can. And Victoria, clarification on that past question, the scenario you depicted, an article published in Harvard Business Review, resharing as a post in the stream, as it were. So that's one approach. An alternative approach might be taking that very same content and creating an article on LinkedIn mm -hmm. saying first appeared in Harvard Business Review. Mm -hmm. What is your thought vis-a-vis -vis those alternatives? Um, I would say that... Uh, I would say that we want to um, open, either one would be a very effective way. Like if you want to share the link and direct people back to the original Harvard Business Review article, you can totally do that. Alternately, if you want to republish it on LinkedIn using our article publishing format, that might be effective too. Um, you do see these articles that go very viral on LinkedIn where someone will tap into something that's in the zeitgeist and it'll just, you know, really resonate with people. and, and explode in popularity. I think of each article that you write on LinkedIn as being sort of like evergreen thought leadership, where you really want to um, create something that if someone reads it today, if someone reads it two years from today, that it's still really, really good and really strong. So I think like you see a lot of best-selling authors leveraging LinkedIn in this way to help build their audience, um, like the Adam Grants of the world, the Brene Browns of the world, like they're really leveraging LinkedIn to kind of engage with their audience and sort of share that content. You touched on the distinction between connection and follow earlier and explained to us how to change our profiles accordingly. Is there a trade-off? Between, you can, you can actually make follow primary and still keep connections. So the thing about making follow primary is that it just eliminates, uh, I would say, the low effort um, attempts to connect by people that don't know you. And so people that do know you can still go through the like process of connecting with you, they just need to click through and, um, and, and scroll down to the connect request button. So I will do this all the time where I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea I wasn't connected with so-and-so. I need to add them. And they might've made follow primary and you just again, go through the extra step. I'll send around the specific um, uh, ways to adjust um, who can send you invitations. Mm -hmm. So who can send you invitations is an additional setting on top of the follow. So first you wanna make follow primary and then you want to go to who can send you invitations and that's where you can decide, anyone can send me invitations, I just would rather make sure that they care enough to send me a note first. 
or do I want to only send invitations or accept invitations for people that are in my um, in, imported invite contact list, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that is in there. Victoria, we're seeing an increase in the use of video, specifically live video on LinkedIn. Can you talk to us about the capabilities for the platform and how does one apply or get selected? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I just um, put in the chat section, apply for LinkedIn Live. Um, anyone can apply for LinkedIn Live Access. Um, the thing about LinkedIn Live Access is that we've seen such a huge influx of interest due to coronavirus that it may be a while before your application is, is gotten to. Uh, but anyone is welcome to apply where we really hope people are able to leverage it to do exactly events like this, um, conversations where people are able to share knowledge, inspire others, have fantastic Q&As or conversations or interactive discussions with their fans. Um, so I can center on the general um, uh, about LinkedIn Live uh, page after this chat. I would need to dig it up. But we've seen all different kinds of ways people are harnessing it, and it's a really exciting capability. And, and again, even if you aren't able to leverage LinkedIn Live, you can always um, upload original video to LinkedIn, or you can also link out to YouTube or Vimeo or other sites where maybe you've done um, a, a really incredible event or conversation that you want to share. So we do welcome sharing video. Can you explain a little more the notion of uploading video to LinkedIn versus linking to YouTube or elsewhere? Yeah, I think um, when you look at uh, people uploading and sharing original short form video, that that's really, um, it's almost like bite-sized pieces of content. So uh, for example, Sally Krawcheck from Elevest, she'll upload um, really fantastic short videos and sort of almost start a conversation with them. So I think where we see people uploading original video to LinkedIn um, is, is almost like as a conversation starter um, versus much more long, robust content like um, let's say a panel conversation from a summit, that might not make sense. And so er therefore they might be linking out to that on YouTube or another source. You touched on hashtags earlier, Victoria. How can someone discern what hashtags are trending at a particular time on LinkedIn? Yeah, so I think that the best way to start is by actually uh, following the hashtags that are relevant to your industry. And then you'll actually be notified of what's trending. Um, so let me go back to Google Chrome. All right, I'm sharing. So mm -hmm. let's say I'm following hashtag marketing. So look at all these fantastic hashtags that come up. I'm going to follow marketing insights. Marketing insights only has 93 followers. But if I follow marketing, marketing itself has 20 million followers. So that is incredible. Um, and so if you follow marketing, you'll be notified when content in marketing is trending. Um, and, uh, and then you'll be able to see like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. I had no idea this content was, was trending and I really want to be a part of that. Um, and you'll also be able to congratulate your colleagues or friends when their content is trending in a specific hashtag as well. So I would say to start off by curating and following the hashtags that are relevant to you. And then you'll be notified of, of trending posts in those verticals and you can merge in that conversation, comment, share, be, be a part of it. Is it better in terms of engagement to be using a hashtag that's very popular like marketing or trying to have a more dominant position in one that's less popular? That's a great question. I would say um, that you really want to be uh, at that intersection between very relevant and also very broad. So if you see a very relevant hashtag like for example South by Southwest 2020, if you were writing an article about it, you really want to use that year's Thing, you know, and then you might want to pull in marketing, you might want to pull in coronavirus, you might want to pull in um, branded activations. So I think like you're really trying to strike the sweet spot between um, being very niche and very targeted. So you're reaching the right audience that's looking for South by Southwest 2020. And then you're also pulling in that more broad audience of marketers that maybe are looking for events that were affected by coronavirus. Victoria, what's the distinction between being engaging and spammy? So for example, we see a lot of content in our stream. Should we comment? Should we reshare? Should we like? How should we think about that if the goal is to be useful and less on the spammy side? Yeah, I think that it's always about less is more. Um, I think that you want to, um, I, I would try to give each one of your posts breathing room. So try to post um, maybe once or twice a day give give them give each post time to shine in the spotlight and really think about am i adding value to my followers timelines 
So if I'm resharing or liking or commenting on something, how am I, maybe I'm target, tagging Margaret in a comment and saying, Margaret, you have to see this. This article is so relevant to you. Um, you know, and you can always send people content privately on LinkedIn as well. So when you click share under an article, it'll give you the option to send it to someone in a private message. And so you may not necessarily need to call out Margaret publicly. Instead, I could just send it to you privately and be like, hey, I know that you're working on the, you know, uh, Airtable fan account. I thought this was super relevant and you might be interested in it. So um, that way, when you share content publicly, you can make sure it's, it's strategic, it's on brand, and it's the right fit for your voice. So Victoria, you have a marvelous newsletter that I subscribe to every weekend that comes out on LinkedIn. Can you tell us about this relatively new capability? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our, our newsletter functionality, um, I'll send around the page about it. It is in beta right now, um, but um, if people want to apply for access, please feel free to reach out. And it basically allows you to create a serialized um, installment of essays where people can subscribe and then they'll be sent the new um, installment in their inbox as well as in their LinkedIn notifications. So um, we are seeing all different kinds of newsletters being created about productivity, inspiration, VR, AI, um, you know, finance, economics, uh, marketing, you name it. So there's a lot of opportunity out there around newsletters. So we have some questions from mid-level or mid-career colleagues. For example, if my role is such that a lot of what I'm doing is not for public consumption, how do mm -hmm. I still maintain an active presence on LinkedIn? That's a great question. Um, I think that uh, it's if you are you know, in a position where you can't necessarily take credit for, oh, this is our amazing event for Pride Month, that, that totally makes sense. I think that that's where you reshare that on-brand content. And then maybe you think about uh, ways that you can be a part of the conversation as well. So if you are comfortable with, with um, writing or analyzing trends that you're seeing, um, are you, you know, curious about a specific issue or subject? Are you able to weigh in on someone else's post? So I think that there's a lot of ways that your voice can be an insightful and helpful one. Um, are you volunteering with a nonprofit or organization or trying to make a difference around something? I think that all of those are ways that you can be a part of the LinkedIn content ecosystem without necessarily being like, I created this amazing billboard campaign or whatever. Like you, you, can, you can be a part of the conversation um, by taking a crawl, walk, run strategy. You don't have to go straight to running. So I think um, making it approachable, making it bite-sized uh, so that you're able to be like, hey, I'm reading this really interesting book about productivity. What are you reading? And then you're starting a conversation. You're bringing your network. Maybe you're, you're suggesting something that people weren't aware of. There's a question around use of the first person versus the third person in terms of writing up your LinkedIn profile or your about section. Is that personal preference or do you have a point? Personal preference. Personal preference for sure, but um, I do, I, I, mine's written in third person. I always think it's kind of weird, but it's, it's easier that way, um, you yeah. know, for, for me at least. And I think it's easier for a lot of people um, to just sort of be like, pretend you're a best-selling author, like put on your John Grisham hat and, or your Stephen King hat or your whatever hat and, and use that to help you write your about page because then you're able to blend the personal and the professional. You're able to kind of convey your story and be like, you know, originally from da da da, this is what they're passionate about. This is what they've worked on and what they're hoping to achieve next. Victoria, what advice do you offer for members who've been laid off as a result of the COVID-19 crisis and how to appropriately reflect that on their profiles? That's a great question. I think that it's, um, it's always challenging to convey that to your network. Some people are comfortable with reaching out and letting people know they've been affected. Some people may not be as comfortable with reaching out and letting people know they've been affected. I think that the number one thing that you can always do is start to reach out and build relationships. Relationships are key. So even if you're not comfortable with sharing your change um, in, in status publicly, at the very least, um, going through your LinkedIn contacts reaching out, asking people, hey, can you do a quick call? I would love to catch up with you. Um, I'm no longer at football company and I really am curious about what's next for me. And I was wondering if you had any ideas about ways I could look next or places where I could look next. I think that relationships are so important. So regardless of whether or not you're comfortable reaching out for help publicly, starting that conversation and rekindling those conversations with others. Um, I think LinkedIn Premium can be a fantastic tool. Um, I, I wish that I had more LinkedIn Premium um, uh, vouchers that I could share with others. I'm always happy to try to see if I can wrestle some from, from the 
other colleagues of mine, but uh, LinkedIn Premium can be a fantastic resource for helping you see who's visited your profile, getting timely trending job alerts, um, helping you stay more informed, um, and getting you access to LinkedIn uh, learning so that you're able to build on additional skill sets um, and things like that. But I really think the, the importance of reaching out and to your network and letting them know, because um, again, you don't know how lonely you are until you reach out and you're able to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm being affected by COVID-19. I think that a lot of people are, um, we're, there's a lot of solidarity right now. We're seeing that very much internationally, where people really are coming together. They're trying to be creative, be strategic, trying to help others. So um, I would say that, you know, in whatever way you're comfortable reaching out to others and saying, hey, you know, could you endorse me? Um, could you help me think about what's next for me? Can you look at my resume? Does it look accurate to you? And, um, and when, again, when you reach out to others, that can help strengthen so much. In terms of your profile proper on the actual profile, would you recommend someone reflect that? I think that, um, you know, if you want to say uh, blah, 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 you know, March 2019 through March 2020, at SodaCo, and um, and then you know if people reach out and they ask for additional clarification, I just think that with with coronavirus that it's because so many people are being affected that that sort of creates a position of um, it's it's a social. Sorry, my cat is making noises. Um, that uh, you know it creates a, a position where it's not as much of a of a liability as I think it might be if there were other circumstances. So I think again it's only as much of um it, of a of a of a burden as we let it be. I think that it, by owning our own stories, by owning our own narratives, um, and by reaching out to others and saying like, hey, you know, you and I collaborated together on this amazing project all those years ago. I'm thinking about what's next for me as a result of COVID-19. Can we connect? Um, I think that that's, uh, that empowers you and, and allows you to think about things from a bigger picture. Victoria, there are a number of questions regarding the use of visuals and how they drive engagement. What's your perspective? Does the algorithm favor a post that has a visual? I think that having a good visual is always helpful. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to say that a great visual differentiates an outstanding article from not outstanding article because I'm always reading it for the content, for the substance. But I think that developing a sense of your own visual branding can only help. So for example, Margaret, brilliant visual branding, always wearing Irish. And so you, you sort of own that visual branding and that aspect of, of yourself as that design and that very much forward thinking um, approach. So I think that as you're creating content on LinkedIn, if you want to use a photo filter, so all your photos are black and white, that's creating a distinctive brand aesthetic for you. Um, you know, if you want to only use photos that you've taken of city landscapes of all the different places you've traveled of your career, that's creating something that's unique to you. And, and I think like it sort of lets people know, hey, I'm cosmopolitan. I've, traveled around the world, I've worked on these different projects. If you work in eco-friendly or sustainable marketing, you know, do you wanna make a conscientious decision to focus on green colors and on a very um, verdant palette? So I think that those, those stylistic choices you make are, are important, but they're very personal. Victoria, what do you see as the most common mistakes perhaps people make in terms of LinkedIn? It's a, it's a wonderful platform, but part of its strength is it continues to evolve and there are new features coming all of the time. What should we be doing to stay abreast of that? Yeah, I think that the best way to stay updated is there's an official LinkedIn company blog um, and there's a lot of updates that are shared on there. Um, and, and then I would also follow LinkedIn on social media, which sounds um, absurd, but we, do our, we are always sharing great, exciting updates and new features. Um, I think that you will be excited about some of the new features that are going to be coming up soon and, um, and new ways that, you know, you can tell stories and interact with people and all that other good stuff. So I would say to follow um, LinkedIn's official blog or site um, for those latest updates. And then um, I'm always happy to connect with anyone one-on-one -on -one and share and support them in whatever they need. There is an advanced question here in the Q&A around the goal of if your goal is to grow followership. LinkedIn mm -hmm. Basic, LinkedIn Premium, or indeed Sales Navigator? Um, I think that those are all uh, different um, use purposes. So LinkedIn Sales Navigator is really for um, prospecting um, specific sales leads. Um, 
LinkedIn Premium allows you to see who's visited your profile and allows you to send in mails to people that you aren't connected to. So if you're trying to grow your network, if you're saying like, oh, if only I could get have a cup of tea with Margaret, I, I know that we could really make something impactful happen, but I'm not connected to Margaret. We don't have any shared connections. The ability to send an in-mail to someone you're not connected to is a very valuable feature for LinkedIn Premium. I forgot what was the other thing that you said. Sales, sales Navigator. Uh, yeah, sales Navigator is, again, it's a sales prospecting platform. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but I think that if you're in a role where you're trying to cultivate those types of relationships, it could be very helpful. Tremendous. Well, we are coming up to the half hour point. And Victoria, I know you have another commitment. So I wanted to ever so sincerely thank you for being so gracious, for giving us more than an hour of your time this morning, and also for taking that time to review those 11 profiles. I know on behalf of those 11 members, they're very appreciative of your contribution. Thank you so much for everything you do. And I do encourage everyone to please follow Victoria Taylor and subscribe to Victoria's wonderful newsletter. I will let you go. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you so much, Margaret. Take care, everyone. And for all our members, there is a poll now. So we welcome your feedback. Siobhan on the Marketing Society will launch the poll momentarily. Thank you for all your engagement. We welcome your feedback. Look forward to our next events coming up in New York and indeed globally. Watch your email channels and social media for those. With that, Siobhan, I think we shall sign off.